Hi there, Dave Levine here. Thanks so much for joining me for episode number 23 of the Sports Stories podcast. Last week, we had two-time Olympian and successful business owner Chris Cook share his story, including many great tips and pieces of advice. Today, my special guest is Steve Avery, Academy Manager at Charlton Athletic. I'm so pleased to have Steve with me as he has also been successful and determined in what he has done. When Steve sets out to do a job, he gives it time, commits wholeheartedly and makes things happen. I'm also so looking forward to hearing more about the journey Steve took to becoming the head coach of the England school's football team and also get an insight from an academy manager that has as much experience as he has. I think it's over 20 years he has been at the club. Before we get started, I'd just like to remind you that the questions posed after the podcast and the book recommendations are within the show notes, so take a look. Okay, let's get on with today's episode. I'd like to wish a very warm welcome to my very special guest, the Academy Manager at Charlton Athletic Football Club, Mr. Steve Avery. Steve, thanks for joining me on the Sports Stories podcast. It's a real pleasure of mine, and I'm so pleased that we've managed to find the space and the time in your pretty hectic diary to come together and have this conversation. Your career pretty much stands for itself, um, both as a teacher and as a um, an academy manager and, and your involvement in the academy over so many years so I'm so excited to, to hear a little bit more about that and I know many of our listeners are very keen to to find out what goes on in the football world and especially from somebody as experienced as yourself. As a way of starting off though can we go kind of back to day one really and uh, can you just introduce yourself tell us a little bit more about yourself and maybe start by giving us your sort of first introduction to sport and why was that important to you? Yeah I think my my passion for sport, uh, interest, uh, when I reflect back, I think I would go all the way back to to my upbringing, really. Um, yeah. and, and two things that I feel um, I should talk about, and that is the, the village I was brought up in, uh, and of course, my school days as well. So from a, from a village point of view, I, I was born and bred in a northeast Derbyshire mining village uh, called Cresswell, near Chesterfield. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm going back now to uh, the mid 60s and early 70s, um, my, my school days. And w- when I think back to that village, which unfortunately, when I do go back there now, I feel is, uh, has died somewhat because the collieries have all closed. The spirit of, of, of that area, I feel, has uh, changed somewhat. But, but in my day, you know, I thought that there was a good provision for sport, particularly particularly at senior level, um, not, not just myself, at junior level, at school, etc. But uh, when I think back to the, the Colliery football team and the Colliery cricket team, who, and they were my two, two sports, really. It was clearly defined as that, football uh, in, in the football season and then changing over to cricket. And the, there was the, as most Colliery uh, villagers did in those days, they, they had teams that played in a good standard, a good standard. So... With the football team, it was that they were playing at uh, like senior league level in Derbyshire, and the cricket team I remember played in a very good league called the Bassett Law League, Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire. I used to just I only lived half a mile away from those venues, and I would be up at those grounds regularly watching and playing with my mates, you know, the football team and the cricket team, and it was always an ambition of mine to to play for those two teams. And lo and behold, I hardly touched them really because I then left for teacher training college at, oh. at 18. Yeah. But I did follow them very closely and it had a big influence on me, I, I felt. And uh, so that's where I, I, I did start to play some of my football and cricket. Uh, not that the football team provided a particularly good junior section. It, it was the men really. But uh, you kind of attach yourself to it really and got to know the, some of the local heroes. Why football or why cricket or why did you choose one over the other or didn't you at that stage? I don't think I did at that stage particularly. Um, and, and that was the same at school as well. Um, one of my earliest memories uh, in, in football, apart from, as I've said, you know, as a, as a boy watching those village teams, uh, I, I go back to my school days, probably my primary school days, and I thought there was a good provision for school sports at my primary school and later in my secondary school that had a big influence on me. Mm. No doubt about that. Um, you know, one of my earliest memories of, uh, of football at school is in fact, um, I think I've got the year right, 1967, 
the year after the World Cup and uh, I played for my school team in, in what was called the Ray Wilson Cup final. Ray Wilson being the England left back in the, in the World Cup team and Ray was from a neighbouring neighbouring village called Shirebrook uh, and that I remember playing in that final uh, and Ray Wilson coming to present the trophy. I captained the school team in that final. Right. And I'll, I'll never forget that day where there seemed to be about 300 people around a, a, a school, fi- you know, a school football pitch oh, watching incredible. the game, probably because Ray Wilson was there. <laughs> but that was a moment uh, in particular from my primary school days with football that I do remember clearly. Go on. And from there, where did you go? Well, I, I then go, of course, into my secondary school life and and I, I, where I'm taking this really is that school sport uh, became such an important uh, part of my life, as well as the fact that as a boy, you're out there playing football and cricket all day long with your mates. When I went to school, I felt that um, it was there for me as well to play school football, to play school cricket. And, and I had then, I think, big influences throughout my secondary school life from some very good PE teachers right. uh, as well. And one of them, particularly uh, when, when it came to the crunch time of making a decision, what am I going to do with my career? Because I played football to a decent standard at school for district and county. Uh, and, and I played for Mansfield Town as an under 18, uh, not, not as an apprentice, but I was still at school. I thought that I was going to be a footballer. That was my dream. But probably then realised through my mum and dad and and, and the PE teacher at the time, who I think was having a big influence on me, uh, a teacher called Glenn Beaumont, who said, well, why don't you you consider PE teaching? So that's that's where really I, I started to think about another career. Uh, and in those days, I just knew that ideally I wanted to do something in sport. Yeah. You know, uh, a lot of my mates were being geared towards, uh, if they didn't go to university, very few did, they would go and work at the pit, yeah. you know, and probably not just as a miner, but probably go and pick up a trade. Yeah. Um, but I, I didn't want to do that. I wasn't practically motivated. I never have been in that respect. It had to be something in sport, really. And what did sport give you and why did you get into it at school? Was, was sport in the family or was it, was, what was your exposure to it and how did you come to being involved? I don't think, I don't think sport, I think sport was, a uh, when I stay in the family, uh, I, th- I thought my grandfather was very influential okay. uh, and, and he used to, not particularly particularly my dad my dad always was a builder he wasn't a miner my dad right but he, he he seemed to be spending seven days a week at work and so it would be my grandfather who, who did who did play to a decent level uh, senior standard locally and my mum I, I just remember my mum always coming and watching me play as well um and when and i had one or two uh, aunties and uncles in the village and we used to, I remember one used to tell me that, uh, did you realise uh, one of your uncles played for England as a goalkeeper? Oh, okay. And I didn't pay much attention to it at the time at all, you know, but until I, I looked this up much later and found out that it was in fact my great uncle, somebody called um, Ernest Scattergood, who played for Derby County really? and won cap for England. So, yeah, there was a bit there. I, I just felt, you know, I... When I think back to my days with my mates, uh, going to watch those two Corrie teams, football and cricket, and, and just the, the play that you did in those days where you'd go into the local recreation ground and we had one very close by the house. That's what you were doing all day long, playing a lot of football and even cricket. But, you know, football where you just down and play. Um, and that was going on in my life. And then, of course, at school, I found that school sport was very organised for me uh, and there was always the provision there. Yeah. So it gave a, a real structure by the sounds of it and, uh, and a, a pathway of some sort. Well it did, it did and, and, and I liked that structure really and, and I think that's, that's me really. Um, I quite like that organisation around it on the extracurricular side of sport and you know I remember the guy I just mentioned, Glenn Bowman, the, the PE teacher at the school, uh, giving me the responsibility of organising the first 11 fixtures when I was in the sixth form. And I thrived on, on things like that, you know. Um, what did Glenn see in you, Steve, at that stage, do you think? I think he, he must have seen my interest. You know, he, he, he must have seen the fact that I, I would play any sport 
that was going at school in terms of school fixtures. So football and cricket were the main two, but, but basketball and athletics, and uh, I, was a, I was also a swimmer. So you played pretty much all the different sports. You, you know, it seems like whatever you had the opportunity to inv- involve yourself in, you did, and just had a go at multi-sports? For sure, yeah, but football was the dream. You know, football and cricket were the two where I felt I was most talented. And um, they were the two that continued to play most of all through into my, you know, adult life as well. So it was, it was the influence of that PE teacher to, to go on to teach a training college and, right. and, and become a PE teacher. And I actually got a place at St. John's at York. But in the end, I had to turn that down for personal reasons and went somewhere more locally to Matlock College in Derbyshire. I went to I went to teach a training college to, yeah. to become a PE teacher, where I probably thought uh, naively that I was just going to teach games, and then suddenly at, at teacher training college, I'm exposed to uh, gymnastics right. and outdoor pursuits <laughs> and hockey for the first time in my life, and 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 in volleyball, a game I'd never played before. So, having to learn well, experience first of all, because it was part of the activity. But having to learn how to teach, you know, some of these other other sports as well, to become a to become a rounded PE teacher, really, um, to to go into the profession. Now, now, Steve, did you think back then? Did you go to teacher training because you were interested in becoming a, a, a PE teacher, and sport was the driver and the the motivation, or was it actually the teaching? And, you know, what, what actually attracted you? Was it the PE aspect or was it the teaching aspect, do you think? I think it's a good question, Dave, because I honestly feel I went to teach a training college just because I wanted to stay in sport. I wanted a career in sport. I didn't know at all whether I was going to become, whether I was going to be a, a decent teacher. Yeah. So, obviously, I had to learn the skill set around that. But But I think... Within that first year at college and the first teaching practice that I remember doing, um, it grabbed me. You know, there's no doubt it grabbed me. The fact that uh, I, I felt I had the enthusiasm anyway to deliver it, which I think is all is, is so important when you're working with young people, uh, having an ability to to inspire, yeah. um, an ability to use your voice. In, and, and I think I trained and got better at that as time went on. So I definitely, in that first year at, uh, at college, felt, yeah, th- this is something I really do enjoy. Um, but I also think that when I went into teaching, so I couldn't get a job locally, which is where I probably intended to, and, and then ended up going down south into, uh, into London, the London Borough of Bexley, where my first teaching post was. I still think when I went into teaching from, from that day one and for the 21 years of my career, Although I enjoyed the teaching every day, I was so much uh, motivated towards the extracurricular side of sport at school and, and then being in a position to organise that, provide for that uh, and, and deliver it on the, on the school curriculum. Well, and, and what was your attraction? What did you see in that, Steve? Well, I just, I just enjoyed because I'd enjoyed so much throughout my upbringing uh, playing sport uh, and and playing those games in particular that I mentioned, football and cricket, uh, I just wanted to be almost in charge of a programme whereby you're teaching and coaching the school team, uh, but you're organising the programme for, for the young people. And I don't know, Steve, but I'm also picking up here. There's something about actually there was a lot of enjoyment in the in the sport that you you and you were wanting to deliver something back. That it's not just the sport; it actually offers more than that. You know, they, when you're inspiring and engaging and motivating young people, what is it that you felt the sport actually brought? Well, I could I could clearly see the enjoyment that it brought to young people if if you're delivering it well, if you're providing. Um, and, and if there's an organisation to it as well, because I feel that, that, that you know, children d- d- do like that structure as well, um, and they like that discipline around it as well. Um, so I, I saw that they were getting so much enjoyment out of it, 
But I, I think at times I was just selfishly almost driving it myself because it satisfied something I wanted to do. You know, throughout my throughout my teaching career, and, and many PE teachers will understand where I'm coming from. Yeah. You know, that I just look forward to the end of the school day as much as I did towards the beginning of the school day. So I might have my four lessons that I had to teach in the school day, but I'd look forward so much to my basketball practice at lunchtime or my football practice after school, as well as the fixtures that came along with it. And I just enjoyed the organization around that and particularly enjoyed working with the young people, seeing how much they could progress as well. Yeah. Because you are, you are, in, in a lot of cases, you are obviously dealing with more talented people. You know, and that, that was something that we'll, we may want to talk about as we go on, that um, I, I wanted also to work with the talent that existed in the school yeah. as well. And I guess the, the people that often turned up to those sort of lunchtime and after schools had a, a greater interest, maybe. They wanted to be there as opposed to it as part of their their educational system and you know or a lesson that they had to be part of so was there something more about you know you're working with individuals that chose to be part of this well, well I, I think I think you realize that you were providing uh, for, for so many across the across the spectrum really okay. you know not not just the, the, the talented ones but sometimes the less talented would come along yeah. and they were all welcome and uh, I, I would somehow try and find provision even for the less talented ones to play for the school teams if need be. Yeah. So it wasn't completely elitist in that respect. I think I took that further in terms of the elitism associated with school sport by, by continuing throughout my career to work at district level, get involved in, in the district teams, uh, particularly in football um, and, and the county teams. And, and eventually leading me on to, on to national level as well. Yeah. So go on then, Steve. Move us on a little bit in terms of your um, involvement in sports. So you say there about your involvement with the district teams and the you know, more national. Um, how did you move yourself towards that then? And, and what, what did your career look like in terms of its panning out? Well, I, I was always interested. I mean, I, as I said, when I went to college, I had to learn how to teach these different sports. And in the early stage of my teaching career, I found myself taking lots of different awards, at different yeah. levels. But you you have to start at level one, of course, um, in, in particularly in the games. Um, so I, I'd get my football uh, FA prelim award when I was at college. I did the equivalent in in cricket uh, and basketball. They were the three in particular. But I, I would take various teaching awards in lots of other. Uh, sports as well athletics for example and, and volleyball but uh, I, I then wanted to take something further and football was always the passion it had always been the dream anyway as a young boy and so i i just decided to take that further um by taking my a license yeah so uh, in terms of qualification and gaining further knowledge i, I went off to lillishall in 1985 to to get that a license but so I'm only kind of seven or eight years into my teaching career, nine years into my teaching career at that stage. Uh, but by then, I, I was taking district uh, and county football teams and being very involved, not just in the, the coaching element of it, because that's really what drove me, but, but also the organisation of it as well. Okay. So where I could help out by, if, if need be, doing some administrative duties if I had to. You know, uh, on at Kent Schools FA first of all, but then latterly in Sussex when I moved to Sussex. So I, I went to Lillishall, I got my A licence, and I think that was defining really because I think having got that qualification, uh, I'd proved to myself that uh, I'd gained a lot more knowledge for sure. There was still a lot more to, to, to learn. Uh, I don't think you ever stop learning, but I wanted to take that further. I wanted to take that further in terms of uh, working with the most talented in football. And I saw an avenue really, Dave, where um, football at the elite level in terms of schools was still 
uh, led by the English Schools FA. Yeah. So I, I saw that avenue where I could possibly work my way towards uh, the top there, yeah. even though I knew it would be demanding. And uh, so that's, that's where I pushed myself towards, I suppose, and tried to prove to others that maybe I was capable of going towards that level. Can I ask though, what, what was it like doing the, the A licence? Because, you know, there'll be many people listening into this that will be aspiring to move through the football qualification kind of ladder and aspiring to maybe do the A licence. Yeah. What was that experience like? What did it really bring to you? Oh, well, I think, it's, I think it's very different from what it is now. I'm not okay. demeaning the quality of the, the course at all now or the qualification. But in those days, uh, having got your prelim, yeah. I felt you had to build up some experience, first of all, before you could even consider applying for the A licence. And, and in my case, it was a further seven years before I applied for the A licence. And you just went away for two weeks to Lillishaw, as yeah. I said, um, which was, for me anyway, at the time, quite an intimidating place. Yeah. As well as the, if you like, the intimidation of, of going on a course with, I think there were 32 others on the course. Yeah. Um, and obviously everybody is desperate to try and gain that elite qualification in yeah. football. I'd have to say that was, although there's many, many challenges throughout my career, I feel that that was one of my first big challenges, going there. And even before I went there, people saying to me, well, you know, give it a go but, and you'll get a lot from it, but you may, may well not get it first time. <laughs> and it, and people on the course, even talking to them, you know, they were some of them were going back there for the second or third time. So I, I paid about I don't know what it was at the time, maybe five or six hundred quid, yeah, you know, and uh, money, expensive, yeah. expensive, yeah. And thinking, dear, I, I can't really afford to fail this. And uh, so I got through. I got through at the age of twenty-nine. Uh, and people were dead right. Not many did get through. I think there's only six on that course of thirty-three that got through. What did you see as the challenge there then? You know, was it a perception or was it, was it a reality that it was a really tough programme but you, you know, you, and you had to work very hard? What was the challenge around it? It was a tough programme physically, but I, I was fit enough, obviously, to, to stay with that. Yeah. Uh, but it was tough psychologically okay. because there's a lot being thrown at you over the course of two weeks. I only recall having one day off yeah. um, uh, uh, where I didn't go home. I just stayed in bed. You know and recovered um, but so it's tough in that respect physically psychologically a lot being thrown at you as I say and and each time you're up there on the stage performing over the four sessions that you you have to deliver and the defining session really was the 11 v 11 as yeah. I recall everybody used to say well if, if you come through the 11 v 11 you, you'll get through <laughs> what did you find out what did you learn about yourself or what did you find out about yourself as a, a person and or as a coach back then from that experience well I, had, I, I think I went into the course with a great deal of belief in my ability yeah, yeah because I felt I'd built up such confidence and, and, and practice really uh, and rehearsed almost for a course like this through the coaching I was doing as I described at those school levels yeah yeah, so I was kind of proving to myself whether anybody was watching. Or, and not, I don't particularly remember having a mentor uh, in preparation for that course. Uh, I might sometimes get feedback from various people watching me. But uh, I think that's where I built it up, really, because that's where there was that difference between teaching in the daytime on the curriculum and the extra extracurricular stuff where you become a coach, yeah. you know. Um, <laughs> You know, the boys probably at times, maybe the boys thought I was uh, someone I wasn't. I don't know. But uh, I, I, that's where I thought I felt I was beginning to hone my skills in preparation for the course. Yeah. I think there's something for me about you really illustrating the importance of playing your trade and practicing your skill. You know, and that's what you seem to be doing in the, the extracurricular stuff outside of the, the, your, your lessons. You know, really practicing becoming a coach. And that's what really paid you good dividend when it came to doing the A licence? Is, is that a... a I, I, I clearly was, and I think I was even conscious of doing that um, maybe in the year or so prior to that because I, I was determined to get on that course and, and once I had got on it, yeah. uh, I was conscious of that, yes. Um, yeah. Whether it be the football I was teaching, coaching or, or uh, you know, some of, some of the other sports as well. Yeah. 
Um, so I felt I was I was confident. I, I had belief in myself. And maybe when you're on the course as well, Dave, what you realise from watching others uh, and some of the feedback you get from the other course members as well in those early days of the course, that, that just gives you the confidence. There's, there was a great bonding on the course, I have to say. And I, I might, when I first... When I first, I remember the first day or two and looking at some of the people on the course, because we had some ex-pros on it, you often do, you know, on, on my course, who people like Steve Perryman yeah. and uh, Phil Holder, and I remember Ross Jenkins, the ex-Watford centre forward, yeah. they were on the course. And, and I, could, I could also see that they were apprehensive about things as well, because they were having to learn a new skill set, yeah. even though they would have felt they had the knowledge and clearly the playing ability. Well, and, well, you raise an interesting point there, don't you? I, I think for me about that sort of, you, were you needing to learn the football or had you learnt the football, but you actually knew about the teaching aspects because you'd, that was the day I job? Pro I probably, uh, I, I, I'm, I think I am definitely would say that uh, I could see myself as a better teacher than some of those people and, and they would admit to that. But equally, uh, I felt from engaging with them as well as the learning that was going on on the course, the delivery from the FA coaches, uh, that opened my eyes to a whole lot more, for yeah. sure. And I, I, even though, I mean, I didn't know I'd passed at the end of the course, you have to wait a week or so, <laughs> but you, you had a feeling, you had a feeling, you know, yeah. from, from your grade sheets, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so, but, but even then, uh, I came away thinking, well, this has been magnificent and I think I've, I've given it my best shot and done, done quite well. I, I still felt that there was an enormous amount to learn right. about the game, really. Um, and therefore, I had to try and ensure that going forward from there, uh, in particular, my coaching should be working with talented players. That would be the avenue that inspired me, inspired me but... I needed to do to develop my knowledge and also I got myself into the coach education aspect of it where I would then become a staff member for Kent FA or Sussex FA on, on the delivery of, of courses. Yeah. Steve how did you um, recognize it and realize for you that working with talented players is what you wanted to do because um, you know, a lot of people, again, listening in, working through the, the coaching pathway uh, are often aspiring or trying to work out who it is that they want to work with and why. You know, is it I'm better off at grassroots level? Is it that I want to work in the, you know, the 15, 16, 17s or with elite? You know, and I think we're suited to different types of players or different environments. And I'm wondering what it was yeah, that landed for you. Yeah, well, I think it's a good question, but I, I think I have to go back to what I started with really in the school yeah. sporting sense where I played school sport to a decent level in those two games in particular. Yeah. And, and, and I wanted to continue working um, at that level, at least at that level, you know, um, when I, when I finished that A license, uh, I didn't really know whether for sure I wanted to move into football full time, like I eventually did. And, uh, and I didn't do for at least another 13 years. I, I um, so much enjoyed my, my job, really, as a teacher. And, and the extracurricular side of it, which was giving me so much satisfaction as well. And if I wanted then to do additional work to that in, with football, I could do some part-time work, such as the coach ed. Yeah. Um, and, and eventually, you know, doing part-time work, working in centres of excellence yeah. as well. So, so building up a portfolio of work and experiences yeah. in all these different environments, but all around football, sounds like it's what you do. For sure, but as, as I indicated, Dave, from, from getting that A licence, I, I, I felt I needed something to, uh, I, I needed uh, something, if you like, at the top of the podium, w which I could aim for. And, and I saw this route and avenue with England Schools FA. Okay. Because at the time, they... To, to become manager of the England schoolboy football team, yeah. you you knew that you would be working with the very best in the country. And and I felt I was always working with good players at, at district and county level anyway. Because in those days, all of the best players played at that, at that level. Brilliant. Yeah, that seemed to be Whereas the pathway now, in the route, wasn't it, through to... Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
gosh. Yeah, I, I'd been down that route a little bit myself, you know, uh, just to talk about the English schoolboys for, for a moment. Yeah, yeah. Going back to, going back to the village life. And I, I remember the trips to Wembley that I went on yeah. uh, with, with my grandfather. You know, he'd take me to watch England schoolboys play Scotland at Wembley and there'd be 60,000 there. Yeah. Uh, all all schoolboys. And um, those days stuck in my mind, you know. So, and, and I had a passion um, from playing district and county level myself that maybe I could play for England schoolboys, but I was never good enough. <laughs> where, do, where does English schoolboys and that sit now, though, Steve, within the, the system? You know, that because for me, even that was a, you know, a, it was a, a fantastic pathway and a route and a very sort of privileged avenue to go down. And yet it doesn't seem to be around as much nowadays. Is, is that fair to say? Well, no, the English schools FA still exists, but that yeah. particular team, that particular team that I managed, yeah. came under the uh, the governorship of the of the FA. Okay. Uh, from around about the time I was finishing, I mean, I, I finished that role in 1994, right. and I think it was by 1996 or, or seven. Certainly, when academies came in, the Charter yeah. for Quality, Howard Wilkinson, that that was when the FA uh, took over. Yeah. the the England youth system from 15 through to 21 okay yeah yeah but they the England school still does have a national team an under 18 team okay yeah. and 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 does that and that sits alongside the kind of the academy system does it well in, in fact now from working in the academy system obviously uh, I have to say that the talented boys within our system and I can only talk about Charlton um, that whilst they're still allowed to play for the school football team, yeah. um, very few of them do. Yeah. They, they make that choice and we, we don't discourage that, but there has to be a balance because yeah. of the commitments needed yeah. towards, you know, the academy programme. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, so you, you came through, you hit the pinnacle in terms of um, managing the England schoolboys set up there, which was, was a goal. <laughs> Um, after that goal, which you you know you set yourself out there and achieved it, so you did the A license and then you 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 looked for, to reach a pinnacle. Where did what happened then? You know, you said you you finished off there in 1994. Why did that come to an end, and where did you go next? Well, it had to come to an end first of all because you you became manager on a three-year cycle. Okay. The, the organisation uh, you 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 had three years assistant manager and three years as manager. I, in fact, had just uh, one year as assistant manager before I took over. Um, and it comes to an end. That cycle comes to an end. And although you can still remain with England schools in terms of getting involved in their coaching on national courses, etc., which I did, um, nevertheless, I had to look for something else, uh, I feel, to, to satisfy the thirst for working with, continuing to work with the talent and, and continue to develop my learning as well. Yeah. So the coach education still existed, as I mentioned, um, but I then went into work part time at uh, Brighton because that's local to where I live in Sussex. And I directed the Centre of Excellence for three years, but, but I did that on a part time basis. So although there was the temptation and there were one or two offers to go full time at Brighton and elsewhere, I resisted that. I just felt more secure with my, my teaching. Uh, job at the time um, from, I suppose from a family point of view as well Dave you know and so I carried on teaching and doing my football part-time working at Brighton still still as a teacher running county teams um, somehow finding the time to do that yeah and, and until eventually you know when I went to work part-time at Charlton for two years from 1998 to 2001 uh, so three years there uh, part-time it was, there came a time where I thought, well, if I'm going to make this, make this break, yeah. um, I've got to do it now. So it was the end of 2000 where I decided to uh, take up the position at Charlton. Yeah. Wow. But I must, just going back to the, to the England schools uh, yeah. experience and time, it was, it, it, was a, it was a difficult moment really to deal with, having been on that high for, for three, four years. Yeah. Um, and experienced uh, those international games at various international arenas around Europe, 
you know, including Wembley, of course, because there was always two games at Wembley every year. Wow. Uh, so just leading a team out at Wembley and then suddenly coming down from that, yeah. it, it, it takes, some, takes some managing, really, mentally. And how did you manage those, that high and then obviously the low? How, how did you navigate that for you? Uh, I think uh, <laughs> I think I'm pretty uh, pretty um, calm and collected and in control of how I do those things. I, I don't get carried away with something, even though, uh, as you can imagine, you know, walking out at Wembley or walking oh. out at the <laughs> Olympic Stadium in Berlin, you know, Incredible. that was one of the biggest moments in Berlin because you're in front of the, they were they used to get the crowds in as well, yeah. fifty thousand. We're in the we're at the game, and um, and I, I experienced that twice. So I try not to get too carried away in those moments. Um, but I think when I finished, I, I just knew I still, even after that international experience, I still had so much to so much to learn. I could only learn and develop. I feel by continuing to work with with talented uh, players. Steve. It- I'm, I'm smiling here because there seems to there's a, a word that keeps coming up for me um, in terms of the, your story here, and that's well, two words actually. One being determination, and there seems to be you know a, a, a quiet steeliness and determination in terms of the direction that you've gone and the way you've plotted your career and your direction, you know. And and the and the other word is learning actually that keeps coming up to me because you've often said I keep learning and I, there's something more for me to find out or to do. And I'm wondering where those kind of attributes have come from. Have they always been with you or have you learnt to be more determined and learn continuously? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think it was one of the famous American coaches, Lombardi, who said, yeah. <coughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's not the lack of knowledge, but it's the lack of will that, that may not get you anywhere. Um, so... And nobody likes failure, uh, but, but I've experienced it and I think everybody has to be prepared for it. Uh, and, and I do think that when I have come across it, I've, I've been determined to overcome it. And it's a message I constantly send out to even the young players I work with now. You, you have to deal with the disappointments, deal with the adversity, um, and continue to have belief in yourself, really. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, going back to the time when I realised, or my family made me realise, that I wasn't going to be a footballer, a professional footballer, uh, but I could still maintain my passion for the for the game, and, and I could probably go on to to deliver it as well as delivering sport. So I, th- I think those messages, you know, remain constant in my mind. Um, but it's, it clearly goes back to the passion, doesn't it? Because I yeah. think you've got to love what you t- you do to succeed. Yeah. And it's interesting, isn't it, there for me? And I'm I'm wondering, how how did your family support you through that at that early stage? Because I guess what you've managed to do, which is brilliant for me, is maintain your passion for football and actually not be kind of connected too much into the the need and desire to need to be a professional footballer. You know, so that you're still connected into the actual passion that you have for the game. You know, you just found a different avenue. And I think that's so important for many of the people listening in in terms of actually how do we maintain our engagement with what's really um, energizes us and, and floats our boat as opposed to looking for an outcome or, a you know, a, just a, a result somewhere further down the line. Yeah, most definitely. Um, I just felt that um, it's an interesting question that because immediately it makes me think of me starting my time at Charlton really where, Again, a big challenge for me because I felt I had to prove myself entering an environment as a teacher, qualified coach, but as a teacher. And maybe there was a little bit of a stigma associated with that in football. Yeah. Um, and wanting to, and I, I would recognize, as I've heard this used by a number of people, that, that I was a guest coming into that environment uh, and that I had to earn my stripes and gain my credibility. Um, but what drove me on, Dave, was the, the passion I had for wanting to succeed in, in, in a new role at the time, of course. So I completely accepted that, that what I'd achieved in the past, particularly in those um, 
those days, you know, with England schoolboys and working to the top level of school sport and school football, I, I, this was different. This was different coming into, into Charlton. And so it was a new challenge, which I embraced. But the driving force was my, my enthusiasm for the game and a confidence I felt in my ability to, to work with uh, young players and to be able to inspire and develop them. But how did you articulate and actually demonstrate um, that, Steve, for, for me, in terms of actually um, earning your stripes in that environment? You know, how, how do you earn your stripes? How did you? Well, you, you, you do it. First of all, I, I, think, I think you need to succeed. You, right. you need work ethic. You need an yeah. integrity. Um, I think anybody does. And... I've always felt that that was there. I don't have to think about the work, you know, because it interests me so much. So there was never any timetable to my day, and I don't think there could be. Um, and I'm often trying to get that message over to my staff now. Uh, if you're going to work with young people, you, you have to be prepared to give them the time, yeah. not just out there on the grass, um, but the time away from the grass as well. Uh, so. It, it was something that was going to happen over a period of time. I didn't feel it could happen immediately. And I felt looking over my shoulder that there were people uh, observing me, watching me. And I have that conversation now, funnily enough, with someone at the club, having been at the club 20 years. And this man still remains in some capacity, Keith Peacock, who, who is really a legend at the club, having played over 700 games. And he was, he was a first team coach when when I moved to Charlton, he was Alan Kerbishley's assistant. And I used to look up enormously to people like, like Keith and uh, Alan. And Mervyn Day was also a coach there as well. So I, I felt they were good people who believed in, in youth development, for sure, as the club did. Um, but I, yeah, I often joke with Keith now that I, I, I felt he was looking at me you know, when you come out and watch one or two sessions that I was delivering, that was a pressure moment, aren't they? But you have to cope with it. It's, uh, it's like that pressure moment of delivering your 11 v 11 on your A licence, yes. you know, and they're all stood around the touchline. Yeah. So all so these you, pressure moments gotta, add up, don't they, I guess? They all add they up. They do, really. <laughs> yeah, they, they do. And uh, so you feel you've dealt with it to a certain extent throughout your career and you feel you can do... I felt I could deal with this moment at Charlton. Yeah. But moving into football... I honestly never saw never saw myself being uh, in football for as long as I've remained because what and of course at one club I never saw that either uh, because I felt it was a very insecure environment environment as it still is at first team level and there was always that turnover but I was hoping obviously that people would view it differently at academy level because I think with young players youth development there's got to be certainly some longevity if you're going to have an influence on on their learning, yeah. you know, and, and the programme and the culture. You've been in the, in the club now, Steve, for 20-odd years. Clearly, you've um, earned your stripes. You know, you mentioned there about having to come in there in the early days and earn your stripes. So that your longevity and your impact's been phenomenal. What, what you know, bringing us up to date and up to speed here, what would you say is your... Um, what are the biggest challenges that you face around now, you know, in, in both in the club, within the academy, well, the, the, but also within football? Well, I think, I think in, t in terms of um, the current challenges, uh, and, and I, I set myself these challenges because I suppose I demand it of myself, is that I, I want to maintain the success uh, that, we've, that we've had. You know, I have to produce, or we have to produce, players for the first team. Yeah. And if we can't produce players for the first team, then the number two objective is that we produce players that can go on and play to a good level of senior football, whether it be professional level or, or maybe semi-professional level. So our productivity is good. Our, our ranking has been quite high over the past uh, 12 years in particular. Um, and so I feel w what I'm trying to do each year now in terms of, if you like, the current challenges that I set myself is trying to look where possible for some, I suppose you'd call them marginal gains, really, that, that you're trying to 
uh, and it, it's seeking out what they are it, it is never easy but um, but I'm, I'm looking in, in, in that kind of area each time to see how we can improve season upon season um, whether it be whether it be in uh, the, the how we deliver to the players or, or whether it be um, something that we, we set as a um, people describe it, something that we try and bring into the culture, uh, I would say. Um, but as I said, a marginal gain that we're trying to do, yeah. uh, trying to bring upon each year. In terms of the challenge over the years, though, Dave, where, where I feel probably uh, more comfortable in a sense of talking about, I, I feel that there's that challenge of, of setting a culture of youth development as a club. It's, you do need that longevity. And I've alluded to that yeah. from uh, from when I started at Charlton. Uh, you need time. You need time for that continuity of learning to take place. Uh, you need time to to create the the discipline of the environment that you want, and I think that's important. Um, to invest the time in people that is needed to help them become um, better people as well as better footballers. Um, and you have to have the drive, really. And, and that's what I suppose I'm demanding of myself and asking myself all the time, have I still got that drive? And, and have my staff got that drive? Um, because if we haven't got that drive, how are we going to drive others? What does that drive look like, Steve? You know, because you've mentioned there a couple of times now about the culture, and I'm fascinated because I think that's such a, a key part and something we often talk about within these clubs and within academies and then again the how, how does the culture relate to the first team environment and so on but you know you're talking there about actually having a passion having a drive and I'm wondering how you measure that in yourself and in others well I measure that in in others by the way I see them go about their work every day you know I, I, I like to see people coming into work looking as if they're enjoying coming into work so they put a smile on their face. I particularly like to see that smile on the face when they're working with, with the young players. I like to see that in terms of the amount of time they're devoting into the day. Um, in a purposeful way, of course. Uh, it's, no, it's no good just coming and sitting at your desk and pretending to work. Um, but as I indicated earlier, I don't think there's any timetable with this job. I don't think there can be. Um, you've got to keep asking yourself, uh, you know, what it is that keeps you going, and what it is that keeps you going is the is the fact that you love the job, the passion, and, and so I look for that when I'm watching someone coach, for example, which is where I probably feel best best served to assess people. Um, I, I like to see that a coach is um, inspiring young people, young players, with his voice. You know, there's an enthusiasm in his voice. There's an energy in the way they go about their work. You can clearly see that. You can see the challenge that they're setting the players. So that's important from the from the session point of view, of course, because these players do need challenging. Um, so I look at I look at all those kind of areas and there's devotion to, to to the job, really. You know, and I understand that you've got to have some balance in life. I I, I get that. Um, I'm always reminding myself of that. But you can't get away from the fact that you have got to devote time uh, to the job. And that means devoting time to people and finding out as much as you can about the players as well. And that doesn't just involve the uh, interaction with the player. That will involve interaction with, uh, with the parent, for example, or gaining a knowledge of the person in terms of the, how they perform at school. What are they like? And we, we've got enough uh, resources in place, you know, that can provide that information. So I look to, I look to see that people want to, want to do the job, clearly, are driven, I suppose, like I am. Um, and and they're, they're really devoting time to it. Yeah. And Steve, you, you've, when you talk about time, you say kind of committing time to the individuals and the development of the individuals. And I'm hearing that both kind of in terms of the players, but also the staff and the coaches in, in the whole environment. Um, my other question is, though, 
in, in the talent development environment that you're in, and you know, you mentioned there about creating players for the first team or other or other professional environments. Does that also take time? And therefore, you know, how do you manage the pressures between, you know, actually getting a return on your investment in that talent development arena where we have to make things work quite quickly? Well, we set targets. We set targets. You know, when we have an academy performance plan, as all academies will, yeah. um, we do set targets for ourselves each season. So they could be uh, targets as simple as the percentage of players that you retain throughout the age groups. But the, the, I suppose the number one target that everybody's looking at is the, the targets of players that you set yourself numbers-wise in terms of getting into the first-team environment um, and making first-team appearances, obviously, in any particular season. Um, and, and what I look at closely as well is well, we achieve the target of players making appearances in the first team we've done that quite comfortably but where I do set a target on myself and the staff is we need to be reflecting back on each season that uh, a player or more than one player ideally two uh, have established themselves as first team players and by established I mean that they probably play 20 30 plus games in the first team right even though that might take time over a couple of years to achieve that. But I feel that when a player has played 30 to 40, maybe more games in the first team, then he's an established pro. And quite possibly then, of course, attracting the interest of other clubs as well, mm. um, considering you know our status. Mm. Um, but in terms of managing it myself, um, for sure, um, I, d I demand of people, I demand on returns. I think yeah. the individuals, we, do, we have an appraisal system, like I'm sure a lot of academies do, where individuals have objectives uh, that must link in with the objectives of the, of the academy as well, season to season. Yeah. Yeah. Another area that you piqued my, my kind of interest, Steve, is also you, you mentioned about you know, developing the person kind of holistically and understanding their families. Um, because they play a big part on who they are as a, as a performer, as a footballer. You know, how do you see the role of the parents and how do you engage with parents to really get them to add value? Because again, you know, a lot of coaches, a lot of people listening into the podcast are, are potentially in the grassroots arena, working with players, you know, and have, have, have to deal with and manage the relationship with, you know, parents who obviously have a, a desire for their children to, you know, to be successful and to do well in the sport. So how do you manage that? Or how do you, how does the academy manage that relationship? Well, the coaches, not just the coaches, but all academy staff are encouraged to interact with the parents. I mean, parents are always, not at this moment in time, of course, because of the pandemic, but uh, parents are encouraged to um, support their, and they, and they do, they're great at that, support their boy in terms of bringing him to training, uh, obviously, and, and whilst they whilst he's training, of course, they can observe him train. Uh, if if they don't don't wish to observe, they can wait in the canteen, etc. Yeah. Um, so we encourage that, uh, like we want to see the parents there, you know, on Saturday morning or Sunday morning watching the games. But the coach himself has to put himself out to get to know in, in every age group coach, for example, who are the part timers. Never mind the full timers. They have to make an effort to interact with the parents and give the parents time. And that's what I mean by, if you like, it's, um, it's the extracurricular stuff. That yeah, it's, the, yeah. it's the bit on top that you yeah. have to do. Yeah. Um, so all that takes place, you could say, informally. But then, but then what we'll do is, in a formal sense, you know, we'll, we'll have our, our parents' evenings yeah. throughout the season. We'll always have an annual parents' evening at the beginning of every season where we'll address the parents at the beginning of the season with some keynote speakers and key messages for the season. Yeah. Uh, not just myself speaking, but others as well. Sometimes getting ex-players or ex-academy graduates involved as well to deliver the message. So we have that annual parents' evening, but then we'll have workshops possibly throughout the, the season as well. You know, so for example, we, 
we have a, a life skills program that we do with, with our young players and the parents will be involved in, in knowing about that program, you know, and what is going on in that program. It might well be something completely new that we decide to introduce to the parents. Uh, it could be social media education, yeah. for example. Um, spent quite a lot of money on that in recent years. Yeah. Um, last season, I remember doing a parents' evening just to educate parents on the rules around agents, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so that they have a, a working knowledge of the rules and what to expect further down the line, possibly. Um, so that kind of thing is going on in a formal sense through the season, uh, as well as the informal, which I think is crucial, yeah. the day-to-day -day contact. You know, whereby parents feel they can contact us and phone me. So every one of our parents has my phone number. You know, I probably wouldn't thank them for all phoning me every week, but uh, <laughs> you know, they know they can pick up the phone if they need to. But more importantly, I think pick up the phone and speak to the age group coach, or if they want to speak to a full time lead coach, or they may want to speak to a physio, for example, if their boy is in rehab. Yeah. So I, you've got to encourage that contact with, with the parents. Yeah, and I also hear a, a very strong sense in the way in which you describe it is, it, you know, this is what it, we we want the environment and the culture to be like around the club and the academy. You know, this is how it is to be part of our academy. You know, we want it to be a free and open engagement. We want communication to be quite strong and free and available because. I recognise that you know the the informalities of those relationships is actually key to the the development and the support and the the future success of the young players. The, the parents, uh, we, we want the parents to buy into our expectations, you know, right. and and the more they can find out about how the academy operates, how the culture defines itself, uh, how it how it works on a day to day basis. Yeah. Uh, so it's not just about observing the coaching that's going on and their son and how he's responding there or how he might be performing, but just just knowing how we how we function as an academy. Um, and you know, I, when, I, when I went to Charlton, it, it had this reputation of being a family-friendly club, yeah. you know, and it's got a strong community programme as well, um, probably one of the biggest and best in the country. So it already had that, and it was one of the things that attracted me. And, and still does because each and every day I walk into work, I feel as if you do know everybody. Maybe, maybe the compactness of the place lends it to the, itself to that. You know, the smallness of it compared with some of the larger academies. But I think I think what's helped over the years, Dave, as well, is that because our productivity has been there, there's been clearly a pathway for the young players. Yeah. The, the parents have seen that as yeah. well. Um, and they see it as a, a good environment for their son to come into, to enjoy his football, develop in his football, but also develop as a person. Yeah. But, but I, I want the parents to understand um, that they're, they're so much part of that journey yeah. and that they have a, a big part to play in it as well. Yeah. And what I get very strongly, Steve, and I, and I hope I'm relaying this correctly, is that actually your focus over the last you know few years or so has not been about the the productivity of the academy it's been in, in, in a sense of actually creating a really solid culture and environment for players and people to learn and develop and improve and as a result of that you've had really good productivity you know and I think getting the place right for the long term has been what you've been really focused on yeah I, I mean I always when I, when I when I came in in 2001 I, I wanted to stay for at least in my mind I thought well I I want to do this for five years at least to, to feel as if I've, I've had an impact, you know, and an influence. And I, I, I do believe that that's what you have to, that's a minimum really, I feel. I mean, there's, there's still too much turnover going on, I feel, in, in too many other places. And sometimes a little bit too much turnover going on in, in, in some of our departments, which concerns me. Um, but I, I felt that that was necessary in order to develop a culture. You're not necessarily conscious of, of developing the culture, but yet you do. I knew from my past experience as a teacher, yeah. if, you, if you're going to have an influence, you've got to have some time with, with young people. Yeah. Um, and there was no good me at the beginning um, quoting statistics because 
I feel they did not have any backup, whereas now I feel I can do. So that helps, of course it does. Steve, we've spoken about this before, you know, in terms of actually the transferability from the education world to the, the academy world. And I, I know the academy world is an education establishment of sorts, given that we're developing and, and helping people learn and improve. But what, what have you taken, do you think? What are the key concepts or elements or principles that you learnt in the school environment, which you think really play out most solidly? Because I'm also really conscious that a lot of, a lot of coaches um, that I've been speaking to on the podcast have often come from an educational background. And I'm really curious as to you know, what it is in education and in that environment that prepares us so well to be successful in an academy and football environment? Well, I, I would start off by answering that by saying that uh, I always felt from early on in my teaching career, going even back to my days when I was teacher training, I had to establish discipline to be able to teach. And no matter what your knowledge is, you, know, you, you, you do have to have some discipline in the group that you're delivering to. Um, and that might sound a very teacher orientated answer, but nevertheless, I feel when you're delivering a coaching session to a group of young players or even a group of senior players, that there's got to be some discipline to it. Um, and you, you expect that from the, the group that you're working with, whether they're junior or senior, uh, but you have to set that standard yourself. Um, so I've always been conscious of that. And I think that would be, a uh, number one advice that you need discipline from the group you're delivering to you need discipline before you can before, before you can deliver properly but you need structure you need organization and you need a work ethic for sure and, and be confident that you know that you want to do it you know because I, i've never had to think too deeply about that because i've always felt that that passion has been there and that enthusiasm. But uh, discipline, structure, organisation, work ethic and passion. Brilliant. I feel are needed. Yeah. yeah. Well, and not only in education and not only in academy football, but I, I guess for many of our listeners, those are you know, four or five key principles that will stand you in pretty good stead in most, um, most business and work environments, actually. You know, they're, they're key principles that can help you be pretty successful at what you do if you do them well so yes and I think I think what I've carried throughout my life is is success just doesn't come to you yeah. you've got to be prepared for failure accept it um, try and overcome it and you overcome it with perseverance um, and, and the passion that you have to succeed and the belief that you, you've got in, in your skill set as well of course you know, and I've had one or two setbacks just at Charlton um, but, but I've, I feel I've recovered from them. But I don't think I'm ever too complacent enough to, to believe that there's still not challenges to be met. Yeah. Sacrifice as well, Dave. Sacrifice. I must admit that, uh, you know, my, my wife would probably be the first to, uh, first to say that. You've got to be prepared to sacrifice. Well, you know, you put 20 odd years into, the, into your education. I'm, I'm simplifying it here. And then another 20 odd years, you know, into the, the academy what's next you know you still feel like you've got a, a passion and a drive to to add some more so what what is next for you both at the club or or elsewhere well i don't know whether elsewhere really i mean it might be that um you know i'm in my, I'm in my 60s now so it might be that this is where i i do finish but even if it's where i finish full time uh the, God given my health, you know, and my, my fitness, uh, I definitely feel that my passion is there to carry on. Yeah. Um, and I feel that I could be of some use, uh, be it to coaches, uh, be it to possibly talent identification, yeah. um, or, or be it to still working with young players in some kind of capacity, even if it's just mentoring them. But currently, I, I, I just know that I still have that passion for, for getting out there on the grass and, and working with young players. Yeah. Um, and, and, and currently, of course, still want to, want to leave the academy. I hope, I did have a passion um, for taking the academy towards Category 1. We're a Category 2 academy. And I think that, in fact, was a, an ambition of the club at one point. 
that that's been put on pause at the moment through you know just what is going on around the club at ownership level and i feel i can't control that um so whether we'll, we'll get to that i don't know but nevertheless if we stay even at the level we're at in category mm-hmm. two then we'll for sure i feel that we can maintain the, the pathway for young players and and the productivity um, that we set ourselves the targets we set ourselves fantastic well, Steve, just before we move into me asking you a, a couple of quick fire questions, I've got, I've got to ask you this one. Um, in terms of talent ID, you know, you've worked in, in education, which I, I, I have a sense, you know, there is a, a principle of identifying talent through education. And then again, for 20 odd years in football, what would be your two or three key tips in terms of how do we identify talent and can we identify talent at an early stage? What's your view? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one, isn't it? Um, it really is a tough one because I could I could mention the technical aspects of the game that you, you look for in a player, of course, um, and everybody I think would give answers such as well you you, you look for you, you look for the first touch that a player might have. Um, you look for the quality of his passing. Of course, we do, but um, I, I look very much uh, young players in terms of uh, when I'm identifying them as to, as to whether they've also got some energy and passion for what they're doing <laughs> that they really do enjoy you know yeah. the football they enjoy their training um, now that might not be evident straight away when you're out there as a scout when you're out there as a scout you you probably what catches your eye is maybe the, the goal he scores or the <laughs> superb pass he makes. And I understand all that, of course. Um, but I think when they come in on trial, when young players come in on trial, I, I am looking to see that they've got some energy about them, that they, they, they really do enjoy their football. And when I think of the, the ones that have succeeded and gone to the top level and have come through our system, they loved football. They just loved football and they loved being out there with a the football. Um, so when I think of somebody like uh, John Joe Shelby, for example, yeah. you know, you couldn't get John Joe off the pitch. You know, he wanted just to be, just to be out there with a the ball. He didn't necessarily always want you to be coaching him either. Right. You know, he, he just wanted to be playing. Um, the guy, the guys that have gone to the top, I felt really wanted to be out there training. They wanted to be out there with a ball. They wanted to be out there playing. They, they had a love for the game yeah. in a similar way that maybe I'm describing I've got a love for the job. Yeah. Um, so they wanted that, they wanted to practice. Um, they didn't have to think about it. It was no chore to them at all. Um, and I think a lot, a lot of young players have probably got that yeah. initially, but that can, can die a little bit, as I see in some young people as well. And I suppose as coaches, we have to be conscious that we have a responsibility there to, to make the session stimulating and make the environment stimulating and challenging as well, of course. Um, but your question on talent ID, of course, you look for the technical areas, of course, but, uh, or you may be looking at some athletic uh, quality, particularly I think speed in the modern game as well, uh, that strikes you about a player. But I, I genuinely do look when a player comes in on trial with us for six weeks or so to see whether he's got uh, a love for the game and energy and competitiveness for the game. Yeah, gosh, good answer. Thank you. Really appreciate that. And, and what's come through very clearly for me Steve is your you know as you say you've had a, a long career but it's actually you're still got a, an energy and an intensity and a, a determination actually for making a difference and adding some value so it's it's really coming through and and I can see and hear your enjoyment and um, and desire to make a difference so thank you for sharing that let me just move us on then into a, a couple of quick fire questions if I may because again I like to provide something for the listeners to maybe take away and go and do themselves or pick up from what's worked for you. So if I may, what couple of books, three or four books have really informed you or guided you in, in your career and that stand out uh, having made a difference? I still think I've got a hell of a lot of reading to do, Dave, <laughs> right? Yeah. I've got lots of books around the house that I've dipped into 
and, and, and not read from front to back. I think the books that in, in recent times that I feel I've completed uh, and they, they stay with me uh, are generally books that have been about leadership. I mean, I, I particularly, I think my number one book there, I'm probably going back now about maybe maybe 15 years, the Clive Woodward book on, yeah. on winning, you know, the 2000, was it 2003 World yeah. Cup? Yeah, yeah that, that, that made a big impression on me. And I think in particular for the detail and structure, and <laughs> that resonates with me, uh, that I felt Woodward put into, uh, you know, plotting that success. Yeah. Uh, and then you had books like the the Alex Ferguson um, book, I think called Leading, yeah. which, which again I, I had a similar in, in impression on me. Um, another person whose books I enjoy reading, and one in particular that I've enjoyed, would be Matthew Syed's book, Black Box Thinking. Yeah, and there's been a few and a few that I've got to catch up on with him. But there, I think, because there were some secrets there of, of high performance, marginal gains, um, and something that also always intrigues me because I look upon myself as how I've dealt with it, how you overcome failure. Yeah. yeah. So uh, th th they will be three that I would pick out, but there's lots to catch up on. Yeah. Well, and, and I also recall a previous conversation that we had about the importance of continually learning and keeping abreast of things that are going going on day in, day out by reading a daily newspaper, you know, and I think that's also yeah. kind of really resonates with me because it's not always the leading and the learning's not always in the books, is it? It's the, there are other mechanisms to pick this information up nowadays. There is, and of course, what I said to you in an earlier conversation that from going back to as a boy really there was always a newspaper in the house the newspaper was delivered every day and and, and i would read it but uh, not not front to back but back to front <laughs> sometimes only the back yeah. you know and and even now you know i, I do buy a newspaper most days and, and and like go straight to the sport yeah you know, straight to there so yeah reading is something i enjoy doing when i have the chance to do it uh, but there's a few books on the bedside at the moment that <laughs> they look good, but I need to I need to get into them a bit more. Yeah. yeah. Well, Steve, you know, again, we've we've talked a, a bit about you know preparation for performance, you know, and you know, in the environment that we work in, that's really key. How do you prepare yourself to be the best version of you each day, both physically and mentally? Well, I think what's it? Yeah, I'll touch upon something else that's important to me, really, in that um, I've always tried to stay fit. I was never conscious that going into PE teaching, I went into PE teaching to remain fit or anything like that, but I knew that I had to stay fit and if you like, project the right image uh, to, to, the, to the young people I was uh, teaching. Um, and of course, I, I will be playing football, playing cricket, playing sports, so you stay fit and you, you know, you don't put weight on yeah. for sure when you're teaching uh, PE and all the extracurricular stuff you do. but. I think since activity slows down a bit in life, um, I've just tried to ensure that uh, I will stay fit. I do quite a bit of running, but I feel mentally prepares me for, yeah. for the day or the next day, as ever the case may be. So that's important to me. Um, and I certainly feel very different if I go through a period where I've not been able to you know, maintain that. Um, so in my mind, that's important. Um, something that you might not have expected me to say, but I, I travel 50 miles to work from door to door. And that door to door in the morning in the car over the past 20 years at Charlton has actually been great for me because yeah. it allows me to get my mind ready, you know, for the day as well. Um, but going into, in particular, each day, I, I like to feel that I've got some structure to it. Uh, and I like to feel that it'll involve some coaching somewhere and that I'm prepared for that as well. So I do like to be mentally prepared um, in terms of how I feel about myself and my body. But uh, I've got a kind of a bit of a tick off list, really, that I know what I'm doing day to day. Yeah. Brilliant. To both the, the physical stuff, but I'm also hearing the, you know, the psychological in terms of having it planned, but also yeah. getting my head in the right space during the car journey. 
be key. And I, and I love the connection between the mind and body because I think we have to get both of them right to be able to perform at our best. Um, and, and yeah, sure. And, and like when you're coming home at night, you know, if I can, I mean, too often there'll be phone calls to catch up on, but uh, I, I like to switch off when I'm coming home at night and put the radio on, be it the sport or the music. Yeah, no, excellent stuff. Thank you. I'm going to take you back now. What one bit of advice would you give to a teenage version of yourself, given you know you've had such a great career in sport and predominantly in football? What bit of advice would you give to a teenage version of yourself now, knowing what you know? I think I think it would start. I'd start off by saying, look, what is your interest? Um, have you got a passion? Uh, mine was sport and football in particular. Uh, and, and then I followed it and I feel if that's a starting point that's a starting point and, and I remember us remember putting those as questions to my son as well because yeah. I, I probably expected him to maybe follow me into sport in some capacity but I, I didn't when I put the question to him when he was 18 19 or whatever it was that I, I detected he didn't quite have the same passion as me so fair enough his passion laid in other areas and, he, and he's ended up going into it so fair enough um but i feel that's what worked for me you know and it's been the driving force really you, you've got to want to do it and i would keep it as simple as that but to succeed i would also say to anyone uh you, you, and it helps if you've got that passion and what you know what you want to do. You've got to have the dedication. I think you've got to have the sacrifice. And, and you almost don't realise you're making the sacrifice. It might take at times somebody to, to just tap you on the shoulder and say, hang on a minute, here. You're, going, you're doing too much. Yeah, but as I said, you know, there can't always be a timetable. Yeah, God. And, and in through your journey as well, Steve, this is a tough question, but who and how many of people could you articulate as being um, key influential people on you? You know, who's really impacted on you that you can think, well, back at that stage, you know, that person made a difference. And you mentioned your PE teacher in the early stages. Is there anybody else that comes to mind? Well, actually, before my PE teacher, I do think I do think my grandfather had a, yeah. a big influence in just in, yeah. it is interest in sport and the fact that he was prepared to take me. Uh, to, to watch um, to, to watch sport and, and watch football in particular um, and so did my dad but my dad I just felt was caught up in so much seven days a week work right, yeah. so the influence from the family there um, but certainly in terms of my schooling uh, I had some very good PE teachers at secondary school I had a very good teacher who uh, who showed a great interest even in the primary school football team and led things there for us. But sorry, what made yeah. them what made them good PE teachers? Why did they influence and impact on you? They, they were they were there for you, Dave. They they were always things were laid on for you. Right. You know the the, the clubs were there. The they shown an interest in you by speaking to you as yeah. well. They could see, I think, that you know me and plenty of other boys, you know, were driven by sport as well, and we loved it. But but they're prepared to put it in. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, throughout my teaching career, I have come across teachers, even PE teachers, who, who, who are not prepared to do that. Yeah. So they have to ask themselves, have they really got that passion yeah. and drive? Yeah. You know? But in, in, in Glen Beaumont, who was my last PE teacher at, uh, at secondary school, uh, I felt he, he had that level of interest in me as a person, yeah. as well as what he was providing for me in terms of the school sports programme. And he was influential, as I said earlier, in, in terms of, you know, me going to teacher training college. Yeah. And then when I, I think about my coaching career, um, I would mention two people, really. One uh, who was an FA regional coach who did take me on my advanced license called Colin Murphy. Um, so he was a regional coach who, who was based in Kent. So I was able to come across him in Kent where I was working at the time. In fact, his son was in one of the county teams I, I ran. Um, uh, and he was an influence on me in terms of the way he coached. I liked his, I liked his structure. 
I liked his delivery, his, his method of delivery. And, and another man who I only wish I could have got to know more, and although I did speak to him quite a few times, I really would have loved to have worked with him, would have been Dick Bate, who yeah. sadly has passed away um, last year, but the best coach educator that I've ever seen. Yeah. And, and from, from a distance, whenever I've been watching him, he, he had an enormous influence on just the knowledge within each session, uh, as well as the way he would structure it and the creativity around his work as well. Yeah. Yeah. And he was a coach who I would always try and get him to do, only managed it twice, but get him into Charlton and, and do some CPD for us, for yeah. my coaches. Yeah. Um, a coach who I didn't know personally, but I always enjoyed watching him because I felt he was so enthusiastic inspired the players he worked with would be Don Howe um, and, and working well into his 70s and every time I saw Don work uh, he inspired me as well as I always felt I learned something and then for three years at Charlton uh, between 2011 and 2014 uh, Paul Hart came to work at the club and uh, at the time Paul won't mind me saying this. There was a disappointment because he actually came in as academy manager and I, I was the academy manager. So I thought at the time maybe that was the end for me. Um, but it wasn't the case and I couldn't control that. It was just new ownership. Paul talked to me, said he wanted me to continue. That meant a lot to me, to, even though we didn't know each other. Uh, and I, for that period, became the head of coaching. So I worked with Paul, successfully, I felt, for three years. Um, and just with Paul, I felt it was the nuggets of information that I would get uh, that had come, I felt, from his football professional career, yeah. his life as a footballer. Yeah. You know, so nothing specific. So it might be something technical or tactical, but it... It just might be something in, in terms of the way he would manage players. Okay. Um, and and, and I, I won't forget the influence that he had as well on me. And, uh, you know, when he left in 2014, and uh, I feel I, I've taken on, you know, many of his good words. Oh, fantastic. And some amazing people there that you've brought mm. to life there for you, but also why, you know, and the difference they've really made. Um, in, yeah. in you and your journey so again thank you for for that Steve that's brilliant um, and you know again those people I've, I've heard been spoken about in many ways and I'm sure many of the people listening in will know those names but not know you know the impacts that they really do have and leave behind with people really close to them so really powerful yeah. thank you you know coming to an end here you you've shared your story and i've been fascinated by the connections between the education system and then the role that you've had and the the impact you've had on so many different people but yet still your drive and your passion for the job that you do whose story would you like to listen to if you had an opportunity whose sports story would you <laughs> learn from or maybe be intrigued by <laughs> that's a tough one dave really you, yeah. you've you, you've got me there in all honesty i mean um I, I love watching some of these documentaries that I've been able to watch during lockdown, you yeah. know, such, such as such as the Michael Jordan one yeah. that everybody yeah. talks about. And, yeah. um, and I, I'd always remembered that Michael Jordan quote where <clears throat> he, he'd taken something like 20, I've got it written down here somewhere if you don't mind me writing it, no. but, but he'd missed more than 9,000 shots yeah. in his career. <laughs> that one, you know, and... Yeah and uh, 300 times been on the losing team and 26 game winning shots and um, so we failed over and over again and so I, when I saw that that documentary was on I thought I've got to listen to this what this guy's life was about um, so I, I enjoyed things like that yeah you, you've caught me there a little bit because yeah. I think I think there's quite a number of people I would I would like to uh, listen yeah. to but uh, I'd have to give that some thought. Well, no, and I think, you know, Jordan's one of those, but, but I think you've even given an insight into some of those people that you 
were um, inspired by, I, you know, Dick Bay, Don, Hal, Paul Hart, even finding out even a bit more about those. You know, it just sounds like you're somebody that's learning off everybody. So I, I properly, properly get that. So thank you anyway. Um, Steve, you, you know, again, just to wrap up, bring us to an end here, you know, you've been on a, a huge journey. Should anybody be interested in finding out a little bit more about what you're doing at Charlton and have done? Could they make contact with you? Is there a way which they could find out a little bit more by either a website or anything like that? Well, it's an open door for sure in terms of um, getting in touch with me, Dave. Um, and uh, it's always has been in terms of not just talking to me, but I would hope wanting to probably come, come to Charlton and spend a day in the environment, really. Uh, and you know that's something that goes on uh, between academies between some academies you know uh, yeah. coaches coaches come to us and we go to them I would always encourage that um, only a year or so ago uh, we delivered a, a coach collaboration day uh, at Charlton which I thought would be a good idea for, for us as an academy to deliver to coaches from around the country so that particular day I felt was successful where, you know, I, I delivered in terms of how, how I felt our culture has succeeded and what was important to us, um, as well as the practical demonstrations that we did. So we, 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 we delivered in that sense and that, that was an open door as well. Um, but if anybody wants to contact me, for sure they can, whether I give my details to you or you give my details to them. Well, okay. Let me let me put it this way: that we can, if they're keen to make contact with you, they can come via me, and I'll pass on the details to you. That sounds like a, a good way forward. Yeah, that's good. That's yeah, yeah. good. Yeah, um, it's always it's always uh, it's refreshing, really. I find always and energising when you know people from other backgrounds in football. Yeah. Uh, let's just keep it to football for now, but it might not be football, but uh, they do want to talk to you. And equally, I enjoy talking to them. Yeah, and you've learned. I'm going to now throw a bit of a curveball in here, just to finish us off. Another one, another one. An another curveball, because it's just come to mind, and you've been ever so humble in your delivery of what you've done, and you know, and I think that's given me a real sense of the person you are. But I'm also aware that you know you've been recognised along the way for the work that you've done in in football, um, via the Premier League and the the Eamon Dolan Award. And I wonder how that landed with you, and what was that like receiving recognition from? from the Premier League and peers around the work that you've done? Yeah, it was a complete surprise to me when it happened in 2018. I, I, I have to say I wasn't too aware of the award. I think it had only been going for one year prior yeah. to that. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I went to the annual youth development conference that the Premier League hold <clears throat> and was told that, um, you know, I would be receiving that award. It meant a great deal, deal to me because mm. it's coming from your peers within the you know, within the industry, we're recognising that. In particular, from my colleagues at work, I'm not sure which one. <laughs> I've still never found out, but somebody nominated me, for sure. And it meant a great deal to me because Eamon Dolan, who I did know, the academy manager at Reading, who sadly passed away, Eamon was a great man. Uh, very humble himself, I felt. Um, very driven himself. Um, I, I saw... I saw a lot of him, you know, or me and him, should I say. Yeah. Meant a great deal. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, Steve, thanks ever so much for giving up your time. I know we could keep going and keep talking because I can feel the passion and my interest in your story. So it just leads me to say a real huge thanks for sparing the time. You know, it's come out very clear to me, your passion for wanting to help others learn and develop. And, and I do really hope that um, our listeners take at least one or two little gems from your story. I'm sure they will. And, and if so, then it's been a job done and you know we've inspired one or two other people. But keep up the great work at, down at Charlton. Uh, I just want to wish you good luck with wherever comes next. I know it's challenging times, both for the club and for football per se, but uh, you know it's very clear to see what you've done. So thanks for sharing that. And I hope to possibly have you maybe on the Sports Stories podcast again at another stage and we can have part two. How does that sound? <laughs> That's great, David, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, what an incredible conversation that was with Steve. His drive and determination to succeed and making a difference to those he works with was clear to see. I really loved 
how he spoke about his passion and interest for sport and how this has been his driving force throughout his career. I also picked up the challenges he has faced on the way and he mentioned that he has faced a number of failures and disappointments but called on his purpose, passion and determination to pull him through. He clearly is an amazingly experienced developer of people having worked both in a school setting, a coach education setting and then as the academy manager. And for me, I was also really interested in how he talked about the development of talent, about it taking time, commitment and discipline and that continuity and consistency is also important in creating good relationships and environments for people to learn and develop. So with all this in mind, I'd like to ask you the following questions. Take some time to consider them. And as always, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Question one, Steve believed it was important to have something at the top of his podium to reach for. What are you reaching for at the top of your podium? What is your passion? Question two, Steve mentioned that passing his A license was a defining moment in his life. What has been a defining moment in your life so far and why? These are a couple of big questions for you to think about over the coming week, which leads me to the next few weeks. We have some amazing guests on the podcast, so please don't forget to subscribe on the channel you use so you don't miss out. There will also be further supporting resources and information available to support you on your journey, whether it be in sport, out of sport, or by using sport as a vehicle to help you. Keep an eye on the website and on social channels. The website address is www.sportstories247.com. It just leaves me once again to thank today's guest for joining me, but also to thank you, the listener, for listening and engaging with me and the content. It is much appreciated. Have a great week, and I look forward to having you with me, Dave Levine, again for next week's Sports Stories podcast.